In this video, we'll be looking at the details of how content distribution networks work. Let's get started. Content distribution networks are platforms for getting data, such as images and videos, closer to the end users that need them. In this talk, we'll give an overview of what content distribution networks are and how they work, using Akamai as an example. As part of this, we'll also review the functionality of DNS, because it is integral to how content distribution networks operate. First a reminder that we have different types of edge networks, some of which cater to serving content, and other edge networks cater to serving end users. So these are commonly called content networks versus eyeball networks, where the eyeballs are the end users that are viewing the content. So we can make some generalizations about these different types of networks. For example, eyeball networks tend to have diurnal patterns, meaning the volume of network traffic changes over the course of the day. In general, eyeball traffic is very low during the early morning hours and picks up over the course of the day and peaks sometime in the evening. Content may have this sort of a pattern if it caters to users in a particular geographic area, but other content is delivered to eyeballs worldwide, and so the diurnal pattern wouldn't be observed on the content delivery side. Both of these types of networks tend to have asymmetric bandwidth usage, meaning eyeballs typically consume traffic, so their download is higher than their upload, whereas content networks tend to be delivering content, so their upload is higher than their download. These sorts of asymmetries can have effects on the peering arrangements that the providers serving these networks are willing to engage in. Content networks also have the phenomenon of unpredictable flash crowds, meaning large volumes of legitimate traffic triggered by some outside event. The internet architecture was designed with these sorts of behaviors in mind, and so it has some level of difficulty in supporting high demand content mainly in the respect that it has to get the content itself, the traffic, from one place to another, and those may be a significant distance apart. So the internet could have been designed differently with respect to this particular application, but it just wasn't envisioned at the time that the internet architecture was being designed. So CDNs are a stopgap measure to fill this need. Effectively, they form an overlay network. Other overlay networks might be peer-to-peer -peer networks, for example. So the key things that the CDN does are using some logic and knowledge of the demand for content. They optimize content placement and direct user requests to the correct content in the correct location. Fundamentally, they're pushing content to the edge. So rather than the content all being centralized in one place, as it would be if you had a single web server or a group of web servers, it's pushed out close to the edge because that's where the eyeballs are. One of the things that the CDN is doing in this process is distributing load. So it's directing user requests to multiple servers that are spread around the geographic area to which they're serving content. And this means that the network load is distributed on different links around the network. And it also means that the server load is distributed across multiple servers. While the primary goal of this is to improve performance of loading the website or delivering the content to users, it also makes the websites or the contents better able to survive attacks because it's now distributed. So there's less likely to be a single point that can be attacked to perform a denial of service. So if we think of our various performance metrics that we've discussed in 3502, the primary one we're dealing with here is latency. By moving the content closer to the eyeballs, it's able to be delivered faster. But we can break that down even further. Latency has four components. These are the transmission delay, propagation delay, processing delay, and queuing delay. We know that the transmission delay is fixed as a function of packet size, or in the case of an entire file, the packet size times the number of packets. So moving the content around the network doesn't change the transmission delay. However, we are seeking to change the propagation delay because we've reduced the distance that the content has to travel. Also in the process, we may have reduced the number of hops. And since the processing delay happens at each hop, Reducing the number of hops should also reduce the processing delay. And we may have also made it less likely that queuing delay will occur. However, queuing delay happens in buffers, and so we can't guarantee that we won't go through the same bottleneck link, which might be relatively close to the eyeballs. But an important thing to keep in mind when talking about latency is that TCP performance is very tightly coupled with latency. Of course, the vast majority of internet traffic is being transported over TCP. So anytime we can improve TCP's performance, we're improving the performance of the bulk of internet traffic. 
Though because TCP has to wait for acknowledgements to come back, the round trip time is a significant impact on how fast TCP can increase its window size and ramp up performance. Akamai is a good example to use of a CDN because it is one of the first and largest content distribution networks and hosts many popular websites that we've all probably used. These statistics were taken from the Akamai website some time ago, but give an idea of the scale of traffic that this network handles. Tens of millions of active streams simultaneously, tens of terabits per second of peak traffic, and almost 100 million web page views per minute. That volume of traffic was being handled by 30,000 servers at 1,450 different points of presence or locations. Note that these points of presence exist in different networks, meaning Akamai partners with ISPs to put the content inside the ISP network to get it closer to the eyeballs. These are distributed throughout cities and countries worldwide. So certainly Akamai is doing many things behind the scenes to decide where individual requests should be served. And we can't directly observe that it's part of the proprietary logic that makes their business competitive. However, some of the outworking of this logic shows up in DNS. And because DNS is a public database, we can observe that aspect of their mechanisms. So as a reminder, DNS is a distributed hierarchical database of resource records. And these are tuples that match a name with a value, or that value might be another name or an IP address. And the type will tell you what the value represents. DNS works over UDP because it's exchanging very small messages, and so it doesn't need the overhead of a connection setup for each request. The hierarchy is set up to have root name servers that own the TLD namespace, and then delegate requests to the TLD servers, each of which handles a particular top-level domain, and those then direct traffic to the authoritative DNS servers that own the namespace for particular domains. Clients don't talk to this hierarchy directly, instead they talk to a recursive local resolver that goes out and interacts with the root TLD and authoritative name servers on their behalf. This allows for caching at the local resolver, which provides a significant benefit to the DNS system. So let's look at an example. Before a request is made for a particular web resource, a DNS lookup occurs, and that's the first time that the client interacts with Akamai. So Akamai is modifying their DNS records on the fly in response to traffic conditions and server loads. So for example, we want to look up an image on the New York Times homepage. This assumes that the browser has already loaded the web page itself, and it's now pulling this image object that's embedded in the page. So we note that the domain for the image is now a1.nyt.com. So even though the browser had already looked up newyorktimes.com, it now has to do a new DNS lookup to get a1.nyt.com. We can use dig or nslookup to explore DNS records ourselves. So if we look up a1.nyt.com, we find that that's actually a CNAME to another name, assetsoriginnyt.com.edgesuite.net. So now we're under a new authoritative server, edgesuite.net. And it turns out that Edge Suite is one of the domains owned by Akamai. This NYT domain is redirecting the client to actually get the resources from Akamai. edgesuite.net is also a CNAME that redirects to a particular server at Akamai, and we get back the A records for two different IP addresses hosting that same fully qualified domain name within Akamai. We want to note that while the TTLs on our first couple of results are relatively long, the TTL on the two A records is only 20 seconds, meaning these will expire quickly and not be cached very long. So this gives Akamai the opportunity to regularly update those IP addresses in response to load and network conditions. In the previous DNS lookups that we did, our recursive resolver was hiding some of the steps from us. So we can go look at some more detail with dig and look up the name servers for Akamai.net so we get a couple of name servers there along with their TTLs and the A record for those name servers. And so we see that this part of the DNS infrastructure is not being updated frequently. The TTLs are quite long. We can then go down a level and look at the name servers for subdomains within Akamai.net. And we see that these TTLs are relatively long and also that we have both IPv4 and IPv6 records for these name servers. We can then use one of the IP addresses for this name server and direct dig to perform a query against that particular name server to determine IP addresses for a particular fully qualified domain name. So when we did this query from the West Coast, we got the two IP addresses shown. And then when we did this from the East Coast, we got two different IP addresses. And this shows Akamai's technology at work. Based on the location of the query, 
it's giving a different result that should send it to a server close to the origin of that query. A few years ago, there was a very interesting paper written called Drafting Behind Akamai. And it discusses the fact that Akamai has to do many, many measurements in order to determine what results should be returned back in these DNS queries. And that what if a third party could observe simply the public DNS records and get some of the benefit of these measurements without having to do the measurements themselves and put that additional load on the network. So in a future video, we will look at this paper in more detail, along with a use case to put these measurements to practical use. The idea here is that it's difficult or impossible to fundamentally change the way the internet works. And so CDNs or other overlay networks are a common solution. One common problem with overlay networks is that they don't understand the underlying network, meaning the internet. So they may do things very inefficiently, sending traffic the long way around, if you will. And in order to do better, the overlay network has to measure the underlay in order to optimize its topology. In general, this requires active measurements, which can introduce a lot of additional traffic to the underlying network. So if more and more people are building overlay networks and performing these measurements, that's going to cause a significant load on the internet, which is not scalable. So it would be better if the existing measurements could be shared or reused by multiple overlay networks. And this is the intuition between the drafting behind Akamai paper. Another bit of background to that paper is that the authors test their hypothesis using Planet Lab. Planet Lab was a NSF sponsored research testbed that was globally distributed. So it provided points of presence all around the world where a researcher could get a small amount of computing and network connectivity and try out building their own overlay network. Planet Lab was used for many thousands of projects, including distributed storage, network mapping, overlays, etc., and had a little over a thousand nodes distributed worldwide. Unfortunately, Planet Lab is less maintained than it used to be, and it's difficult or impossible to get new resources on it today. Today, however, we have the Genie platform, which can be seen as a successor to Planet Lab. And so for doing this type of research, you could look to the Genie program to get access to resources that are distributed all over the United States. That wraps up our discussion of content distribution networks and the DNS. We'll see you in the next video. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.